Hello. Um, I have an interesting subject here uh, I'd like to share with you. And uh, it uh, pertains to uh, a witness, that, uh, some witnessing that I was able to do a few days ago. And uh, I was out in Walmart uh, shopping, doing a little shopping. And I, ran, I was in an aisle, uh, camping aisle actually, and I run across the older gentleman that was well, probably a little bit older than myself. And uh, we just started talking a little bit, and pretty soon uh, we ended up start talking about uh, Alihim. And turned out that he was a Christian of sort. Actually, he was uh, a Jehovah Witness. And so he asked me what religion I was. I told him I wasn't a had I didn't have a religion. I was in a relationship with the Creator, and uh, so that brought forth a bunch of other questions. And so he started asking me stuff, and uh, I was answering the best I could. And uh, he listened to me for quite a while, answering his questions, of course, and. Uh, then uh, in about, a, I don't know, I guess 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, uh, I sensed uh, a shift, okay, in his uh, continence, and he began uh, bruntly defending his religion. And so when he started defending his man-made doctrine or his religion, Yahusha kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're done. And so I adhered to the voice of Yahusha and bid him farewell and started to walk away. And all of a sudden he said, hey, wait a minute. So I turned around and he said, what translation are you reading? And I said, well, generally I'm reading what they call the BYNV or the cipher, but mostly the BYNV. It's a Hebrew to English translation. And he said, oh, that's the problem. And I said, excuse me? He said, that's the problem. We use the MEV. Have you ever heard of the MEV? And I said, yeah, I've heard of it. Matter of fact, I have a copy of that translation at home. And he said, well, that's the best one there is. And I said, well, why do you say that? And he said, because they take all the translations there is, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they studied them all, this big, huge group or organization, uh, or council of sorts, Christian council, and they got together and created the best translation that has ever been made by using all the other translations and the Dead Sea Scrolls together. And I said, well, you know, I don't, not doubting your word that they've done that, but I said, uh, my translation doesn't seem to be too much different, the MEV, off from the King James. I said, I think they used the King James and just changed a few words around. And uh, he said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, they used the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and all kinds of different translations to create that. He said, it's the best one on the market. And uh, so I said, well, what's the name of, what is the name in that translation that they're called the Messiah? And he said, he thought about it for a second, and then he said, the Messiah. And I said, no, I didn't ask you what uh, the title was. Uh, Messiah uh, simply means the anointed one or anointed king or high priest, the anointed high priest or king, uh, 
I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you what is the true name or the uh, the name that they're using for the Messiah. And he says, he thought about it for a minute. And he comes back and says, Jesus Christ. I said, aha, there you go. I said, that's translation has been translated based on the King James Version, and both of them together have been based on the Latin Vulgate because the Latin Vulgate uses that name, which is a false name. And so he just kind of stunned, stood there like a deer in the headlights, and he said, well, I hope we both end up in heaven and see each other in heaven. I hope we both make it. And so I said, well, I got to get going. I says, but uh, I said, before I do, I'd just like to say that you may want to open up that MEV and any other translation you may have at home and read the preface. Have you ever read the preface? He said, no, sir, I have not. I said, well, I highly recommend you do that. And I said, you'll be surprised what you'll find in the preface of those translations. And so he thanked me and everything. And I said, uh, before I go, I said, there's one other thing I'd like to share with you. And it's this, you can save a whole lot of time. Okay, a whole lot of time by simply Googling Yahusha. You spell it Y-A-H-U-S-H-A. -S I said, best thing to do is just Google Yahusha and save yourself a whole lot of time and research. But it's probably still important to read that prefix because that'll open up a lot of doors, you know, turn on the old light bulb up there. And he said, oh, well, I'll, maybe I'll do that when I get home. And that was about it. And we said, you know, nice talking to you and whatnot. And I left. So uh, I started doing some research on that uh, a few days ago when I got home. And uh, very interestingly, uh, the prefaces in that, MEV and the NIV are all uh, very, give, give some very eye-opening information. It's, it's kind of mind-blowing, really. Uh, well, we did have a conversation about uh, Yahuwah versus Jehovah, too, okay, with that Jehovah Witness, so we won't get into that, but it was, a, it was an interesting uh, conversation we had. I don't know. Uh, hopefully, he does some research on that and Googles Yahusha. But anyways, in the NIV, let's start in the NIV real quick so that it'll make more sense when we get to the MEV. Um, it says in the preface, it says, in regard to the divine name. And then they have the tetragrammaton there is Y-H-W-H. So, you see, there's a deception there. Uh, commonly referred to as the tetragrammaton, the translators adopted the device used in most English versions of rendering the name as L-O-R-D in capital letters. It distinguishes it from Adoni, another Hebrew word rendered L-O-R-D, for which small letters are used. Whenever the two names stand together in the Old Testament as a compound name of G-O-D, they are rendered sovereign, L-O-R-D. And they just go on and on with it. And then down here toward the end, it says, To achieve clarity, the translator sometimes supplied words not in the or original texts, but required by the context. If there was uncertainty about such material, it is enclosed in brackets. Also, for the sake of clarity or style, nouns, including some proper nouns, are sometimes substituted. See, they're meant and substituted for pronouns. 
proper nouns are substituted for pronouns that are meant in that too, and vice versa. And though the Hebrew writers often shifted back and forth uh, between first, second, and third personal pronouns without change of antecedent, this translation often makes them uniform in accordance with English style and without the use of footnotes. In other words, they stayed with L-O-R-D and G-O-D. <laughs> or L-O-R-D the most, you know. But anyways, uh, it, it says in this NIV, for the Old Testament, the standard Hebrew text, the Masoretic text as published in the latest editions of the Hebrew scriptures was used throughout. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain material bearing an early stage of the Hebrew text. So now I'm talking about Paleo Hebrew here. They were consulted as were the Samaritan uh, writings and the ancient scri uh, scribal trans uh, traditions relating to textual changes. Sometimes a variant Hebrew reading in the margin of the Masoretic text was followed instead of the text itself. In rare cases, words in the Constantile text were divided differently from the way they appeared in the Masoretic text. Footnotes indicate this. The translators also consulted the more important early versions, the Septuagint, uh, which is Greek, uh, Aquila, the Semachias, and the Theodosian, the Vulgate, right, there's the Vulgate, see they're admitting it, the uh, Syriac, Persheta, the Targums, and for the Psalms, the Justa Hebraic of Jerome. Reading from these versions were occasionally followed where the Masoretic text seemed doubtful and were accepted. Principles of textual criticism showed that one or more of these textual witnesses appeared to provide the correct reading. And then goes down here and says the Greek text used in translating the New uh, Testament was an uh, electic one. No other piece of ancient literature has such an abundance of manuscript witnesses as does the New Testament. Yeah, because there's 5,000 Greek uh, texts, you know, and none of them are, uh, are alike. That's why. Where existing manuscript, uh, manuscripts differ, the translators made their choice of reading according to accepted principles of New Testament textual criticism. In other words, they leaned heavily toward uh, the Greek, the English, or the King James. Footnotes call attention to places where they there were uncertainty about what the original text was. The best current printed texts of the Greek New Testament were used. See, the Greek New Testament, the best uh, printed texts of the Greek New Testaments. You know, so you can see where that what's going on there and uh, so amazingly um, we go to the MEV and it says in here the allergenic clergy working on the King James Version stated their purpose not to make a new translation but to make a good one better they also wanted to make the B-I-B-L-E more known and accessible to the people. Thus they produced the King James Version in 1611. Later, the University of Oxford produced a standard text of the King James Version known as the 1769 Oxford Update and edited by Dr. Benjamin Blaney. Blaney standardized the punctuation and spelling to update the King James Version. Uh, they're going to update it, all right. The 1769 Oxford Update is the edition commonly used today. 
The King James Version has been the standard version of Protestants throughout the English-speaking world for over 400 years now. Its flowing language, prose rhythm, and powerful and majestic style made it a literal classic, with many of its phases and expressions embedded in the contemporary English. Today, realizing the need to update the King James Version for the 21st century, <laughs> Just going to keep updating it, right? For uh, 46 scholars, or 47 scholars, serving as professors or chaplains in the armed forces of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and to the United States Armed Forces, comprising, comprising the Committee on Bible translation under the leadership of the senior editor advisor, Dr. Stanley Horton, and the chief editor, Dr. James Lindsay, having joined forces to produce a more updated edition of the King James Version called the Modern English Version, which is based on a modern English vernacular, 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 uh, and then we jump down here, it says, uh, the original motive for creating this translation was to provide an update by military chaplains for the troops so they could understand the King James Version better. This project grew larger than anticipated in the search for academically qualified scholars when the chaplains enlisted the help of those who were not chaplains to get the job done and when an unexpected publishing opportunity was offered. Ooh, when he came into the picture, so people jumped. <laughs> yeah. The target audience grew from the military to the entire English-speaking world. The translators began their work on June 2, 2005. They completed the New Testament on October 25, 2011, and the Old Testament on May 28, 2014. The 47 American and English translators being in great Christian unity and cooperation who have a personal relationship with G.O.D. through J.C. and who have formed an interdenominational translation committee represent churches such as the Baptist Union of Great Britain, the Charismatic uh, Episcopal Church, Central Church of the Nazarene, Church of Christ, Church of England, Church of G.O.D., Elim Church, Evangelical, Lutheran Church of America, Free Methodist, Church of North America, General Council of the Assemblies of G.O.D., International Church of the Four Square Gospel, Methodist Church of Great Britain, Methodist Episcopal Church, Presbyterian Church of America, Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America, Southern Baptist Convention, United Church of Christ, United Methodist Church, and the United Reformed Church. The translators represent a cross-section of the English-speaking church. Ooh, a cross-section. So it is their prayer that the modern English version will please the entire English-speaking world. Wow. As professors or graduates of some of the world's leading colleges and seminaries and universities, they represent institutions such as the Assemblies of G.O.D. Theological Seminary, the College of William and Mary, Evangel University, Fuller Theological Seminary, Geneva College, Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, Harvard University, Hebrew Union College, Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, Oklahoma Baptist University, Oral Roberts University, the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies, Pentecostal Theological Seminary, Princeton Theological Seminary, Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary, St. Leo University. Let's get the Catholics involved. 
the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, Stanford University, the University of Notre Dame. Let's get the Catholics and Catholics involved. Vanguard University of Southern California, Westminster Seminary, California, Westminster Theological Seminary, and Yale University. Let's get the lawyers involved. The translators are devoted to making a good translation better and ensuring that the modern English version is an accurate and responsible update of the King James Version. So right there, they're telling you they're just updating the English, the King James Version again. It's been updated a bunch of times already. I don't, I don't know how many, but at least 40 or 50 probably, if not more. It's all it is. It's not what the guy said it was. So apparently he's never read this preface. Are you impressed with all the universities that helped out with this? I am. The work of translating scripture has always been an important part of Christian missions. Due to the work of missionary Bible translators, um, the complete B-I-B-L-E is available in over 400 languages today. Menaceries Missionaries normally have not used ancient Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic texts in translational work. Instead, they usually have relied on the King James Version. In the manner, the modern English in this manner, the modern English version is useful to continue translation work on the mission field. The modern English version is a translator's B-I-B-L-E for missions work to provide the word of G-O-D to all English speaking people in the entire world. Now let's compare the original Tyndale translation with the updates of the following passage. So here we go. I mean all they're doing is updating the King James Version. They're not uh, using uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and Hebrew texts and all the different translations that exist to form a better uh, scriptures. They're just updating the, the King James, and this is what it's all about. And here's the proof. In the Tyndale, it says, For when the world uh, through wisdom knew not G-O-D, and wisdom of G-O-D, it pleased G-O-D uh, through foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And in the King James Version, 1611, it says, For after that, in the wisdom of G-O-D, the world be by wisdom knew not G-O-D. It pleased G-O-D by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. In the King, King James Version, 1769, that they just told us about, the bishop one, for after that, in the west wisdom of G-O-D, the world by wisdom knew not G-O-D. It pleased G-O-D by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And then in the New King James Version, 1982, it says, For since in the wisdom of G-O-D, the world through wisdom did not know G-O-D, it pleased G-O-D through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So they're just playing with it, doing a little bit of word games so they can put a patent on it. That's all they're really doing. Getting money out of it. And then here's the MEV. For since in the wisdom of G-O-D, the world through its wisdom, its it was added, did not know G-O-D, it pleased G-O-D through the foolishness of preaching, uh, they left out the, of the preaching, they just went of preaching, to save those who believe. So I only say what they did, they took, they added one word, little word, and they took one little word, word out. That's all they did. That's the only difference between the New King James and the MEV in that particular sentence. That's it. That's all they did. Okay, so uh, it says here at the end, it says, The clergymen and scholars comprising the Committee on Bible, or B-I-B-L-E, translation, offer up to G-O-D the modern English version, the inspired word of G-O-D. 
how can it be the inspired world DOD if all they're doing is updating the, uh, to a different version, the modified version? It's a, it's a translation that can't be inspired. In the spirit of praise and gratitude for the purpose of making disciples and teaching all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. At least I got that right. The name. They didn't make it plural. They left it singular. Name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, which is Yahuwah. Or Yahusha is the deliverer. So, you know, that just kind of debunks. Uh, what he said there. Um, and so the Dead Sea Scrolls is another thing that they have manipulated. You see that book right there? This is the updated new translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, they go through here and they give you the fragments and the different scrolls and stuff that they have. You know, they have them all numbered. And they, and they interpret or translate the, uh, the Hebrew or the Aramaic, the Paleo-Hebrew and the Aramaic. Uh, and amazingly, they, these, type, these people that wrote this, NIV and MEV, are basically got a hold of this and they made sure that the translation out for this Hebrew and Aramaic Dead Sea Scrolls matched their English translations from the Greek, from the Greek and the Latin. And they, all these right here, here's some of them. You see those in the yellow? I marked right there just on this one page. Just this one page. The whole book's like this. It says, words of blessing belonging to the instructor by which no bless, which to bless those who fear G-O-D. May the L-O-R-D bless you. May the L-O-R-D grace you. May the L-O-R-D lift up his countenance upon you uh, from the flesh and with the holy angels uh, by G-O-D to uphold his covenant forever. May the L-O-R-D bless you, uh, the men of G-O-D society, serving the temple of the kingdom of G-O-D, ordering destiny with the angels of the presence. May G-O-D put the fear of you upon all who hear a report of you. So, if you get the point I'm trying to make there, they've not, they also replaced or substituted the true name of our creator or deliverer in this as well. So it would match these, this as NIV and this MEV and the KJV and the NKJV, all of them English fans, they want to match it. They want to keep you fooled. They can keep you uh, in the delusion tricked. Okay, they want to trick you and fool you by telling you that the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the Quorum Caves over in Israel all have G-O-D and L-O-R-D in them. They're, they don't have the real name in it. I got a book to deceive you with. And then they even tell you that their that their uh, their controversy that they, they're probably they're forged. All kinds of crazy stuff in here about them, man. <clears throat> so they're scrambling to hide what they've done over here, but yet they've admitted it in their own preface. You know, it's, it's, it's almost crazy. So uh, on the back here, the authors wrote a little deal. Uh, but, I mean, these are credits by other people about the authors. And it says, uh, I'll just read one. It says, the work of translation and interpretation will be of immense value, this work, uh, to the scholar and general reader alike. The commentary provided by the authors is illuminating and accessible, and their translation into English 
of some of the scrolls for the first time will give us all a chance to evaluate these controversial documents. See that? Controversial documents. And perhaps lay to rest some of the wilder theories. Wilder theories that have been involved about the quorum sect in recent years. It will thus aid our understanding of the religious imagination in all its complexity. The rest of them say something similar to that. See, so they're trying to make it like there's a controversy that it's 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 there's something ain't right, but they did an English translation. So they're admitting right there, saying that it's an English translation that they changed the Hebrew names and replaced it with substitutes, devices, and quote unquote English translations. Like, so, oh, we changed, that's not the, how you say that name in English. We wrote that in English, just like they did all the other English scriptural translations. So they're trying to make it match to keep you in the dark. Okay, so uh, real quickly, uh, out of the one of these cipher books I got here, it's called the Yosephus Wars, Wars of the Yehudim. Uh, it tells us right here. Yeah, see that right there? If you can see it, a mitre. Also, a mitre. Also, a fine linen encompassed his head. Talking about the high priest, which was tied by a blue ribbon, about which there was another golden crown, to which was engraved the sacred name. It consists of four vows. So the Tetragram Maiden consists of four vows, according to an eyewitness of the first century. Okay? So that's Yod Hey Uhe. Those are vows, all right? Now, an interesting thing here that I want to bring up, I find this real interesting, is that uh, the word device that they use in their preface for, for substituting the name, the true name with the device. Uh, if you look into the dictionary, and we'll go to this Webster's All-in-One Dictionary and Thesaurus, the uh, device says, it's right here, okay, to the arrow, device, all right, says, device, a scheme, it's a scheme, they're scheming, a scheme to deceive, a scheme to deceive, stratagem, it's a stratagem, a scheme to device, to device is a scheme to deceive, it's a stratagem, and I'm like, stratagem, what, what does that mean? So I turned back here, and I looked up stratagem, okay, <laughs> I looked up stratagem, where is it, stratagem, it's right here, okay, And listen to what this says. <laughs> it says a trick. Trick or treat. It's a trick to deceive. A trick to deceive or outwit the enemy. What? A deceptive scheme. Skill in deception. A trick to deceive or outwit the enemy. A deceptive scheme, skill in deception. And listen to this. Artificial, device, dodge, gimmick, jig, ploy, scheme, slight, trick, wile. Mind-blowing uh, that it says... A trick to deceive or outwit the enemy. To deceive or outwit the enemy? Who's the enemy? Us? We're their enemy? Of the translators? Because they said they replaced it with a device. 
to deceive or outwit their enemy? We must be their enemy. I mean, that's crazy. Read it yourself. Apparently, we're their enemy. And they're trying to trick us and deceive us with their wiles. With their gimmicks, with their tricks. Unbelievable. And just so that you don't think that, that, that that's uh, some kind of made-up deal. Uh, here's Webster's New World College Dictionary, 4th edition, right here. Okay? See what it says. Under device it says, um, a thing devised, plan, scheme. A sly or underhanded scheme, trick, an invention or contrivance, which we know it's not that, but uh, hey, yeah, pretty much the same thing, right? I don't know who keeps texting me, but I wish they'd stop. Uh, So if we go over here to stratagem, again, stratagem, it says um, a trick, scheme, or plan for deceiving an enemy in war. Any trick or scheme for achieving some purpose. A trick. Are you hearing that? Any trick or scheme for achieving some purpose, a trick, a trick, scheme, or plan for deceiving an enemy in war. They must think the war, they're at war with us, with the commoners, the laity. <coughs> the scholars are at war, the nobility are at war with the commoners. Man, that kind of opens up a whole new light on the, mar on the beast system, doesn't it? Nobility. All right, the nobility, the the clergy. There's your scholars, the nobility, and the clergy. I mean, the laity and the commoners. Right. So the, apparently, these guys and these guys, these two guys, are at war with these guys, according to what that mean. That definition we just looked up. Mind blowing, man. So anyway, don't fall for their trick <laughs> through their device. <coughs> Stratagem. Look it up yourself. Pretty amazing stuff. So anyways, uh, this gentleman that I spoke to, this Jehovah Witness, uh, obviously is, uh, is, is in error, and he's been told something by somebody and uh, he was believing it. So I hope he reads, you know, the preface to that MEV and that NIV he was talking about to me. And uh, hopefully he'll Google Yahusha and find out the truth. And uh, maybe someday he'll get out of that Jehovah Witness business, out of the religion. Yahuwah has no religion. No religion required to worship the Creator. And that's what I told that man. Uh, if you if you want to research the Dead Sea Scrolls and find the true name of the Creator and see it with your own eyes for yourself, there's a lot of different websites that you can go to. Don't get that kind of translation like that, the one I just showed you, uh, because all they're doing is just a bunch of Christians uh, trying to make, trying to cover their tracks, okay? They're scrambling to hide their, their, you know, their false doctrine, okay? And they're trying to make what, oh, see what the Dead Sea Scroll says? It says L-O-R-D and G-O-D, just like our English translation, our KJV does, uh, uh They're just, they're lying. They're doing that to cover up, to cover up their devices, okay, their stratagem, okay, they're at war with you, apparently, you know, it's, it says they say so right out of their, their own writings and their preface, 
they, when they said that device, they're saying that they're at war with. We're, we're the, considered the enemy, apparently. So they must be working for somebody that's opposed to our master. See what I'm saying? They must be working for the father of lies. Because that's deceivement. That's a lie. Any type of deceivement's a lie. No matter how small it is, it's a lie. And it can't be of Yahuwah. Because Yahuwah is light. There's no darkness in him. He, he cannot lie. That's one thing Yahuwah cannot do, folks. Should I dare say it? Yahuwah cannot lie. That's a big statement, but I will say that because Scripture says that he cannot lie. All right? So it must be from the father of lies. All lies, no matter how big or small, come from the father of lies. That's where they originate from. Apparently, we're the enemy. They must be working for the father of lies with their devices and their stratagem. Okay? Anyway, uh, some of the, and I'll put these, uh, you know, down at the bottom here too, but uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls dot org dot il, Yahuwah is the way dot com, uh, we are Hebrew dot com, uh, Pinterest, P I N T E R E S T, Pinterest dot com has a lot of good articles on there about. The true name found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Sites. Sites.google.com. WOL.JW.org. WOL.JW.org. IMG. Or J, I mean. IMJ.org.il. Elia.com. E L I Y A H.com. And you can simply just Google Dead Sea Scrolls, and a lot of stuff will come up. You can re do a lot of research in, off of there just by doing that. But if you put uh, the true name or true name found in Dead Sea Scrolls, or Paleo, Hebrew name found, written in Dead Sea Scrolls, and you Google that, a bunch of stuff will pop up too. All right, so, yeah, it's... any of these sites you'll be able to find it and then on the pictures following this video when you're listening to the song uh, you'll be able to see some of the websites posted with the with the pictures of the Dead Sea Scrolls too you can copy those down if you want to you know take a look at it with your own eyeballs um, by the way that song that I usually play at the end of the all of our lessons together uh, it's called uh, Yahusha Living Torah. Um, I did make a post on one of my uh, uh, videos to a uh, link to that song and a few other songs by that guy. That's James Anson. James Anson, A-N-S-O-N. Down under True Name Music. And the name of that song is Yahusha Living Torah. So James Anson, Down Under True Name Music. And like I say, there's a blue link on one of my videos that you can find that and download that if you like that song. I know a lot of people have been asking me where, how can they get that song. So I, I put that, the blue link on one of my videos there, one of the more recent ones, so you can search through there and find it. But anyways, appreciate you watching. And, uh, you know, watch out because we're the enemy. Apparently. <laughs> All right. So long, beloved of Yahuwah. And remember to stay in love with Yahusha. Bonus feature time. Okay, so the... Uh, Translators of the MEV and the NIV were the first ones to present their case in this lesson today. So now it's our turn to present our case. The first uh, scripture says, Proverbs 18, 17 says, uh, I mean, uh, Psalms 118 says, 
The first two present his case seems right till another comes forward and questions him. That's Proverbs 18, 17. Uh, Psalms 118 says the name is the rock the builders rejected. Okay. Uh, Proverbs 18.10 says the name of Yahoo is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. So the Sinai autograph or the covenant name that uh, on the covenant when we we're given our commands Okay, we find it in the first, the third, the first, definitely the first and the third command uh, is Yahuwah. So his name is Yahuwah, and it appears like that, the top one here. Okay, it's yad Hey hua Hey, four vowels. These are four vowels on this top line here, it says Yahuwah. See Yahuwah right here? Yahuwah, that's Yahuwah. Yahusha, this bottom one's Yahusha. Okay, so these are four vowels. According to Yusuf ben Matnyahu, or who they call Flavius Josephus, he was the first century eyewitness that saw that those four vowels written on the headpiece of the high priest. We just read that. Okay, that was his testimony. Okay. Um, a direct Hebrew to English transliteration uh, is uh, in English. Uh, Hebrew is written like that. And then in English, it sounds like Yahuwah and Yahusha. But in Hebrew, it sounds like Yahuwah and Yahusha. <laughs> There's no difference. None at all. Uh, the, the Hebrew root word for deliverance or salvation is Yasha. Okay, so Sha is deliverance there. So it's Yah, where I am, and then uh, the U is your deliverer. I am your deliverer is what Yahusha means. But they don't they sound the same. Hebrew or English don't matter. It's Yahuwah and Yahusha. China, in Chinese it's Yahuwah and Yahusha. Okay, in Latin it's Yahuwah and Yahusha. In uh, Apache Indian it's Yahuwah and Yahusha. It, it doesn't change. Names cannot change. They cannot be translated. They must be transliterated and carry over the same sound in any language. It don't matter. Otherwise, they, how would you know it was your name that they were calling on if they called you by some other name? If your name could be translated into other languages around the world, how in the world would you know they were calling you when they said a, a, your name differently? You know, that's come, come on, man. That's common sense. You wouldn't know they were calling you. So your name cannot change. Otherwise, it wouldn't be your name. I mean, that that line needs to stop. Uh, Yahoo and Yahusha share the first three letters. See that? The first three letters. They read from, from here this way. So they go from, they don't go like we do. They go this way. Okay, see the first three letters here? They're uh, basically, here they are. See, they're the same. So you share the first three letters. These symbols are the original Hebrew letters of the name Yahuwah uh, on the top there and Yahusha on the bottom. Hebrew is read from right to left, and the first three letters of both use the same letters given the sound Yahu. Expressions like G-O-D, L-O-R-D, Almighty, Eternal, Adoni, Hashem, Creator are not personal names. Everyone who defends the use of these expressions uses the excuse that we are speaking English, and these terms we are familiar with are translations. Most of these words are not originally 
English. The term G-O-D was never used to refer to the true creator until Christianity went to the North area or the Norsemen in the 6th century CE. The original Hebrew pronouns commonly translated as G-O-D in our English are all, A-L, all, Allah, Ali, or Allahim. The Hebrew pronoun all conveys the meaning of upward, lofty, strength, uh, high one, most high, awesome one, the root being spelt alif lamed, uh, A-L. This is describing a being of infinite power. The pagan deities never became angry or pleased because they simply aren't there. They're, they're fake. They're myths. Okay, their mythology, myth, mythology, myth. These Hebrew terms express what pronoun our creator is, but not used as his personal name. He has a name and only one name. You can find, you can read in Acts 4.12 that we're to call upon the one true name. Objectives attached to his name may modify it, causing people to think he has more than one name, but he does not. If you look up Yahweh in an encyclopedia, Yahweh is one attempt to sound the name using English letters originating from four Paleo-Hebrew vowels, yad Hey, ua Hey, or Yahuwah. If you check the NIV or the KJV, like we just did, or the MEV, preface, and you'll see that they admit removing the name and replacing it with substitutes, which we just read, or devices, which we just read. A stratagem. Stratagem. Enemy. You're the enemy. Uh, paleo or paleo. Uh, paleo means ancient in Greek. So ancient. The Hebrew word for ancient is atik. Reminded of those antiques. The letters are written from right to left in the original script. We call it Hebrew, from one of Shem's descendants whose name was Eber, Genesis 10. A few generations later, Abram was born, the son of Terah, one of Eber's descendants. When Abraham's nephew Lot was carried off by invading armies, the text says, one who had escaped came and informed Abram, the Hebrew. That's in Genesis 14, 13. Hebrew is called the Lashon Kadesh, or the set-apart tongue. So Hebrew is really is a language. It's really not a nation or a, or, a, or a people, really. They just speak Hebrew, so they call them Hebrews. Just like people that speak English are called Englishmen. See that? Same, same type of deal. Uh... So there you have it, and there's an enemy out there that is teaching falsehood and using substitute names to hide the name of our Creator from us and hide the true name of our Deliverer, which we must call upon for deliverance from us. So we have an enemy, Stratagem, and they use a device to trick us, deceive us, to hide the true name, okay, because we are their enemy. They don't want us to know the real name, so they must not want us to be delivered. Those who love you are the ones that care about your salvation. So apparently, they have a, a, another agenda, such as mon monetary gain or power to control. You know, pride, they want to be above you, envy, jealousy, okay? So anyway, uh, beware of the enemy. Seek out the truth, and only the truth, because the truth matters, and you matter, because Yahuwah loves you with an everlasting love. Thank you for watching, and remember to stay in love with Yahusha HaMashiach. So long, everybody, beloved of Yahuwah.
Baruch Haba Vashem 